And my father never shared his stories, but my mother started to share his stories early on. Apparently, I was a poor eater. That is not the case today. But at that time, I didn't want to eat lunch. And in order to eat my lunch, my mother would entertain me. And she would start telling me these stories about um, a camp, a, a, a place that they went to in the mountains where she met my dad. Well, when you're six years old, all you want to hear about is how your parents meet. And they had dances, and um, my mother was giving out medicine at the end of the night to the different people who were there. And she would say, my dad's room for us. And um, they would talk late into the night. And I thought that was great. And she would tell me how she would like iron for the different people. And she would tell me about the friends that they had. You know, so and so, the Rolsteins. And you know, the Shomowitzes. And you know, these people. And the Hollanders. We all met there at this place in the mountains. Okay. Well, as I'm a little bit older, I started asking more and more questions. Well, why were you all there? Where were your parents? And the story started coming out. So you see right now my parents are, that is their wedding picture in black and white. Um, they had a civil ceremony and they had a wedding for a small wedding for their friends. And those are my parents on their 40th wedding anniversary. Um, not long after my mom passed away, she was 62. But um, she would start telling me her story, and I would start listening and asking her questions. And I had many nightmares, because there was a discussion of how soon should children be exposed to the Holocaust. It can be very troubling to a young mind. But I wanted to hear more and more. She shared more and more with me. She grew up in a small town of Petrova, which is in the Hungarian part of Czechoslovakia. Ironically, both my parents were the first to get, say, they're Czech. But, which I am, but that was, Czechoslovakia was much bigger then and encompassed part of Hungary and part of the Ukraine. So my dad went to Czech schools and my mother went to Hungarian schools and only her brothers went to Czech schools. So she had to learn a new language after the war. She um, was one of the youngest of nine children. Her parents died of natural causes when she was still quite young. And her, the siblings, the older siblings, raised the younger siblings. And she had a girlfriend who she was very jealous of because this girl was much better off. She had the good toys, she had the good dolls. And my mother says that when they were deported, that this girl went mad on the cattle car. But it got to a very important point. Whether you survived the war or not, two things mattered. Luck. I think luck mattered above everything. You could be the smartest person, you could be the sneakiest person, you could be wealthy, you could be poor, but if you weren't in the right place at the right time, you would not survive. And secondly, your age mattered. My mother was 14 when they were deported. Now imagine a 14 year old mind having to go through what they went through. But she was with her four older sisters, and miraculously she was able to stay with her four older sisters throughout the war. Um, they were put on cattle cars, they were transported to Auschwitz. They went through the selection. Luckily, my mother, although very thin, was her present height, so she was like 5'3 by then, and she passed the selection. Her older sister, then the one next to her, had a rather big mouth, opened her mouth up to the Congo in the, in the um, concentration camp, and um, was beaten severely. They were all going to be punished. They begged to stay together. And the couple said, fine, we're going to go out on the next transport. And again, what we of her was the Holocaust that I used to talk about is the choices, choices. Sometimes you had a chance to volunteer, and you would raise your hand and say, yes, I raise my hand, I want to go. But you never knew what it was long you were volunteering for. It could be for death, and it could be for life. If they didn't tell you, if they told you, that's also, it still didn't matter. It just so happened that the five sisters were put on a transport by a truck and taken to a farm to be laborers on a farm. And that saved their lives. Not only were they no longer near the gas chambers and subjected to daily upheld, which we'll discuss through my dad's story, they now could even steal a little potato once in a while or a little piece of vegetable, and they could have extra sustenance. So while we're talking about the sustenance, Let's go over what the sustenance was in a concentration camp. 
It was a piece of bread and coffee, the coffee being brown water for breakfast. And then you labored all day long. And then at dinner time, there would be some kind of frothy liquid that would contain maybe potatoes, maybe turnips, once in a while, even some kind of meat that was left over. And what you got depended on when you came in and how the labor went into the liquid. So it could just be liquid, and you could have been lucky enough to have about that potato, a slice of bread, coffee, and then you went to bed. The beds were not beds, the beds put in slats. They put them sitting on the floor on, on lice infested straw. It was different from camp to camp. So my mother was very relieved to have been taken to this farm. And she was on this farm until the end of the war. Um, her biggest fear, she said, during that time was that there would be a fire and that they would put them off into the barn every night. And she thought it was a fire, they would have no way of getting out. But other than that, she said, as long as they worked, they weren't terrified of their lives. Unfortunately, when she um, went to, when they were taken out of that from the farm and went back to the camp, they um, were put on death march because it was very obvious that the Germans were losing the war. It was never quite clear what they were going to do with the masses that they marched out of the camps, but they might have used them for human shields or whatever they were going to use them. My mother during that march said that she was totally numb to anything that was happening around her. She just walked and walked. It was cold, it was still winter, and um, the toes on her left were froze. She was um, liberated by the Russians, much to her fortune. The Russians were very familiar with frostbite and were able to amputate only her toes. But she was only 16 years old, and she worried who was going to marry me with these kind of toes, and she begged the doctor not to amputate further, and the doctor said, we'll see how you heal. So here she's 16 years old, and she is very ill. She had tuberculosis, and she was sent to the Dutch Mountains for recovery. While she was there, her siblings who were all over the sheep, started going either to their hometown or trying to get a visa to immigrate. She was in that hospital for two years. During that time, her older sister and oldest brother got their visas to Italy, which they stayed to eventually made their way from Austria to Italy, to America. Her one sister settled with her boyfriend before the war in Budapest, and another sister went to Ukraine, very close to where um, Ashley and her father came from, and married there. So by the time mother was recovered enough to leave the hospital, she was alone. So at 14, she was totally a baker too, because she was a baker fan, and she probably never even made scrambled eggs. And then here she was 16, as sort of an invalid, very weak, and she's all alone in the whole world. What saved my mother is her friend Yarnala. She was Gentile, she was four years older than my mother, and she took my mother in after the war and let her live with her family. How this happened is that this wasn't a phone call, the phones were not, they didn't have phones. She just had to my mother with her to Prague, knocked on the family door, apartment, and she said, Mom, Dad, this is my friend. Can she stay with us? She didn't know where to go. Yormela became my aunt. Her parents became my grandparents. Her daughter and my daughter have met. We visit each other. We visited her twice already. We're in constant contact. The families are extremely close, and I'm forever grateful. And I just saw you know, she's 87 years old now, and she's telling the story. So it was wonderful to hear about my mother when she was young. I just went there for my 60th birthday, my husband took me there, and I saw the little cottage where my dad came to propose signing to my mother. So now I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I wanted to close that chapter. My father's story was a little bit more difficult. I never heard my father's story, really. Um, I do, I have a transcript. So these are my father's parents. My father, my grandfather died of a um, of pneumonia from coming in from the field and drinking water too fast. My grandmother, on the other hand, um, died in the gas chamber with her two younger children. Um, so here's a picture 
Um, ladies, would you stand up, sweetie? That's my daughter. That is she. This is her. When she was a little girl dressed up in a, you know, how they dress up like an old fashioned costume. Notice the girl over here? You can see the similarity. Not only are they similar in looks, but they also are, she's named after that aunt. So her name is Tina and her name is Tina. And one time when my daughter's girlfriend came to play and she saw that picture of my grandmother and her little daughter, she said, oh, is that you in one of those costumes? And so I always say, you have to live for a Tina who never got to live. Um, my father's family, they were sheep herders. They didn't really take care of the sheep themselves. They had people up in the mountains taking care of their sheep. And they had a farm. And my father said, my father lived in a true shell. We were supposed to see it right before we immigrated to America. And it was raining, and the car would go through to the shell. So nothing changed in the times since my dad left. But in that little shell, my dad was, it was third Jewish. And of the third, most of them were related to my dad in one way or another. So he grew up surrounded by family. Holidays were wonderful. It was huge rooms so where they would sit up in the barn or somewhere and they would have these great meals. For my father, holidays were always extremely difficult. I didn't exactly grow up in a happy Jewish home. In fact, whenever there were holidays, my father was in a very bad mood. And I didn't understand why until much, much later, almost when he wasn't around anymore. Because those are the times when we think about family. Those are the times when we want to be surrounded by family. And those are the times that he did not have anybody but my mother and I. And then Mary Valley and on her, her sister and her husband. So it was always a very difficult time. He never quite got over it. My mother seemed to be able to talk about the Holocaust quite freely and without any emotion. And my dad just didn't talk about it. That transcript that's difficult to read and I will discuss in the form that I just wanted you to see it is what he told me to type for him, even though he could type it, um, or maybe he typed it, I honestly don't remember, but it's a transcript that he used when he was interviewed by the Holocaust Center for his um, video tape. And it was actually an audio tape at the time. So I'm going to refer to it just so you can see the wording that he used because I think it's very powerful. So my dad had a very lovely upbringing. He went to Czech schools. He spoke four languages every single day. He spoke Yiddish at home. He spoke Czech in Czech schools. He spoke Russian with the Russian kids. So he spoke, um, you know, and, and learned Hebrew. So he was living a very Jewish life. And um, as I just want to tell you a little story. This is good to think of these people who went through the Holocaust as having this life before, this very rich life before. He said he went to the sheep farm farmers to visit them, to see how the sheep farmers were doing. And he had a really good time with them. He started coming back at dusk and he was surrounded by a pack of wolves. And he had matches with him and he lit a fire and got away from them. So I always love hearing that story. But it's this and he grew up in, in the country. And um, he they got to eat it, his family. So he was the oldest, he was the head of the household, I should say, by the time he was 14. Because at 14, he lost his father. So at 14, all the responsibility went on his shoulders and basically never left. He always felt this responsibility, including for my mother when he met her. Because she was like a little baby out of woods. And he said, I'd like to teach her everything. Because she just didn't know how to live her life. Because she was abandoned so early on. So he, um, there was a edict issued by the, by the Hungarians. Now, this is important. My dad worked in the Carpathian Mountains, and we always think of Germans, Germans, Germans. But actually, over there, it was the Hungarians who were equally brutal as the Nazis. They hated the Jews. They closed the Czech schools because the Jewish kids went to the Czech schools. So they closed the Czech schools, so my dad was in sixth grade. So he didn't have anything beyond his sixth grade education by the, before the war. And um, he decided, he was uh, six, almost 16 by then, that he was going to join the Partisans. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Partisans, they fought against Germans or against Hungarians by bombing railroad tracks or disrupting them in any way they could. Jewish Partisans fa faced a triple threat. 
They face the threat from the farmers. The farmer that will give you bread today might decide to turn you in tomorrow for extra rations of food or for a promise of being spared or whatever, of keeping their cows from the Hungarians or from the Germans. They face the threat from within, from the other partisans who are not Jewish, who were not thrilled to have Jews around them. And of course, the greatest threat was from either the Russians or the Hungarians that were after them because of what they were doing. My dad was with the partisans in the mountains for two weeks, and then he knew that it was time for his family to gather, to be transported to a town about 12 kilometers away. And that Saturday night, he went down from the mountains to say goodbye to his family. His mother begged him to stay with them. His mother said, please stay with us. You've been the household, head of the household. We need you with us. And he listened. Was that a life-saving choice? He lived through the Holocaust. He saw horrible things. When he survived, we never know. Again, it's a choice that he had to make. And that is a choice that he had to live with. Um, he stayed with the family. They, were t they had to march for 12 miles. Young children, young babies, the elderly, the invalids. So they were thinking about wheelbarrows or wagons, whichever way you could transport yourself. To a town of Shemperitze, which was 12 miles away, and they were put in a section of town that was you know, emptied out for them, and every family got one room. Families were lost then. They could have had grandparents, they could have had nine children. Didn't matter, you got one room per family. My father was fortunate in a way that there were four siblings and a mother, and there were only five of them. He was actually allowed to go back one time to their hometown to pick up additional provisions, because they could bring things with them, so they brought flour, bread. And again, we talk about this, we all know about this, but imagine if I said to you, you've got to have five minutes to pack up what's important to you. But you don't know where you're going to go, you don't know how long you'll be gone. Winter clothes, summer clothes, photo albums, bread clock, all of those things could be life saving decisions that you would make, that you would have to keep. But you really didn't know where you were going, so those choices were extra difficult. And he said when he came home, his entire house was emptied of everything, and the prize lane cow was at the neighbor's next door. So he took that prize lane cow and hit it on the ground straight, send it straight into the meadow. He said, at least they won't have that prize when they come. But he went back, and they were there for three months, and they were washed out of there three or four kilometers to a train. The cattle car, how many of you have been in the Holocaust Center and seen the cattle car? Okay. So now the Holocaust Center, I have to handle everything except for the cattle car. That totally, absolutely broke me. Because both my parents described that in great detail. Probably more detail than anything else. The having to own, room to only sit, the body design, the babies crying, the bucket for water and the bucket for illumination. Imagine how we're all so modest, but people back then were even more modest. How, how what that would have done to your psyche, what that would have done to your to your family, how you would have shielded your children, how you would have shielded your older parents, how you knew you could protect them. So um, this is what my dad said basically about that. He said, we passed Poshice, which is in Slovakia, so we knew we were not going to congregate the labor camp, but we were lying to. So now they knew that they were going east. By that time, the rumors of the concentration camps reached my father's village, but of course nobody believed them. But they knew that bad things were happening east, and they were supposed to be going west. Or southwest who were hungry. Tuesday to Friday, water, toilet, dying in car, 50 to 60 to a car, no room to lay, only to sit. Math, dogs, swimming, running, prisoners in striped clothes, left, right, left, right. Took away little brother, uncle, mom only 42 strong, but she had a baby in her arms. No clue who was left until after the war. So you can imagine there was no time to say goodbye. Lights were shining in their eyes. Dogs were barking. They were being hit right and left. And the disorientation. When my mother 
loved the cow, or she thought that she was in, in, being sent somewhere to a mad asylum for men. And she thought, why are they taking us women to this mad asylum for men? Because the women said they were shaped, and they were all striped jocks. And my dad also didn't know where they were going, so he asked the Poles, who were been there the longest, to see how you would survive the war, depending on where you were geographically. If you were Polish, you were in the concentration camp much longer than if you were Hungarian. The arms swept sort of in this manner. So, of course, if you were there for three years, your chance of survival would be much less than if you were there only for six months or a year. <coughs> so the Poles who were made from Kapos, Kapos for information, there were Jews who were actually became instruments of the Nazis. They were there the first to watch the prisoners firsthand. And they became hardened. They sometimes were even more cruel than the Nazis. And they said to my dad, see those chimneys burning? Your mom's in there now by now, burning along with them. That's the kind of mentality that you got there. And um, he said that they were selected into groups. He was 16 years old, and you didn't know if the groups were good or bad. And they were being marched out of Auschwitz into Buchenwald, and they were saying Kaish along the way. They didn't have to work Wednesday through Saturday, but then they got blankets and food. And then they were put on to a truck for through the 60 for a three hour trip through Dora. Dora was another concentration camp, and it was not built yet, and it was raining. And the couples said, Rest tonight, work begins tomorrow, and they got some hot soup. Then there was the appell. So the appell was one way to demoralize the soul. You were already terrified and scared. It was cold. And every single morning, you had to line up to be counted off. Sometimes the counting was one, two, three, four, shoot. One, two, three, four, shoot. Just for their enjoyment. Sometimes it was just the counting. Sometimes the counting didn't go well, and they would be standing in the cold for two hours at a time. He said on the first day, it was very hard to work. There were only meetings, because the SS wanted to break them in. And they were from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. They were bringing in bricks and cement, and they were building these huge tunnels. The tunnels were to be protective uh, and a protected environment for the Germans, where they would actually ride two sheep side by side. That's how big this tunnel was. And that would be for storage or for security if they were needed, like a bunker. And on the second day, a couple said to the young boy, here's a whip, and you have to beat anybody who doesn't work hard enough. And he showed him how to do it. And he put the youngest boy in the craft. And the boy said, I won't do it. And he was shot on the spot. Who's next? On the third day, it was hot. And they um, rushed back to get water, because they were thirsty from working all day. And the couple said, nobody drinks till I say you can drink. And they kicked the bucket over, and they didn't get water. Then he was transported to, so they built this underground factory with lights and everything that cars could go into. And there were over 30,000 laborers between the three camps of Dora, Hartsfield, and Elric. And if you were sick, dot, 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 you imagine what that meant. Um, he somehow, he said that in February and March, he somehow lost his clothes. Maybe they had um, some kind of a shower once in a while, and when he came out, his clothes were not there. So between March and February and March, he only had a blanket and a string and cloths to wear. That was winter in Europe. And um, finally, they were marched, in March, they were marched into a hard stone, which was a bit of a better camp. It was built for another purpose. It actually had beds with straw where you could, you could lay down. And there, he was very close to death even if he was only 16 years old, after being a laborer with the food that I described he was eating, he was extremely weakened. Somebody somehow recognized him where they talked about where they were from, the prisoners. And somebody said, your uncle's here. Your uncle Rosenberg is in this camp. My father found his uncle Rosenberg, and uncle Rosenberg saved my dad's life. Uncle Rosenberg was an artist. Art runs in our family. I'm an artist. My older daughter's an artist. Like there's a big money through. And Uncle Rosenberg painted portraits for the Nazis. Now, when, if I say that to you just like that, you imagine, well, a Nazi sat on a chair in the middle of the camp, and my
behind Rosenberg painted their picture. He wasn't quite like that. The Nazi families lived on the outside of Herzog. You know, after the war, everybody said, we had no idea what was happening. The German population, we had no idea. Oh, yes, they did. They lived outside of the camps. They were other families. Sometimes they even lived in the camps. Like in Theresa, there was a block of houses for the Nazi families. So Uncle would sometimes go out of the camp to paint the family. Sometimes he would paint the Nazis in the camp. And, but he was liked. The Nazis had felt they had a little bit of a relationship with him. And he intervened on behalf of my dad and said, my nephew's here, he's very close to death. Could you transfer him from the transport to something within the camp? And he was able to get my dad into a broom making factory. My dad said it was like heaven. It was a glass kind of building, no heat. But he was sitting during the day, and he was out of the elements. And every so often, his uncle would be able to share an extra piece of bread with him. At one point, my dad was actually asked to deliver a painting to a Nazi family outside of the camp. When he went to deliver his painting, he was waiting in the vestibule. The woman was going to give him an apple. And there was a mirror on his left. And he looked in the mirror, and he just backed away, and he touched it. Because there was an old man staring back at him. He was 17 years old. He didn't recognize himself. It was the first time that he saw himself. When he got back to the camp, um, they found their bread on him, and they beat him severely. And from that time on, he said he always had back trouble, which I really didn't know until I read this. And um, that's how the, and the war went for him. I mean, he just was in the broom factory, still very weak, and they were marched out of the camp for a dead march. And they ate grass by the side of the road. He got separated from his uncle. He didn't know anybody who was walking around him. And the man died on the side of the road. My dad bent down to pick up his shoes because he still had the claws. And while he was putting on the shoes, the bullet grazed him because they missed. And so it just grazed his shoulder. So he didn't get hit. He didn't even tie his shoes because that would have certainly meant another bullet. And he walked along. They go on a train. They drove on the train for an hour. But the Allies bombed the train tracks. They had to turn around. They had to go back. And they were put into a barn overnight to be marched back. By now, they were in Germany. And my dad said, I'm not moving. I'm not going to leave this hay. I'm going to cover myself with hay, because I'm not going to die like a dog on the side of the road. And in the morning, when they said, mach, 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 schnell, my dad just stayed. But they weren't in the time to do an appeal. They didn't have time to make sure they had everybody along. And they were rushing out, because they knew that the allies were very close. My dad went through a deep sleep. The next thing he knows, a fellow prisoner, a Russian, is shaking him away with a piece of bread in his hand. My dad said, I was so confused. Just the day before, he would have killed me for a piece of bread, or definitely not shared it with me, and now he's offering me bread. The Russian prisoner explained that at 4 a.m., the Russians came, the Americans came through, and, they, and the, Russian, the Germans ran off, and they were all free. Well, what do you do? How do you move on? The Germans were commanded by the mayor of town, who, was, who the general talked to, that they had to give bread now to the Jews, because before they only gave it to the Germans. They were given a ticket to ride if free in Europe anywhere they wanted to, so they could go home. And of course, the, until the Red Cross came to set things up for them, the local villagers had to supply them with food and clothing and take care of them and do them housing. My dad found a distant relative in Pulsen as he was traveling back home. There was nothing for him at home, and he was extremely ill. And he returned back to Prague for treatment. And in Prague, the doctor said, you have to go after your surgeries to Tetra Mountains to recover. So now we tie that. So that's how my dad went to the mountains. My dad actually had a fiance. She decided to follow her sister to Israel when we still could, before the communists put down the iron curtain and you could no longer leave. With the idea that when my dad recovered, he would follow her. My dad had a decision to make. Here was Anne, my mom, who was in need of being taken care of. His fiance was probably never going to get to see again. So he decided to finally start courting my mother 
and that's when he came to the cottage in Prague, outside of Prague, and proposed to my mother. Every, all these couples that met up, and I, and I have to digress, this is the first time I'm telling that story for those of you who have heard, I just got a contact on Facebook from a, from a Ricky from Israel. I don't know Ricky from Israel, I ignored it. She at, was at me. I am Vera Bernalstein. Oh my God, I kind of remember you. She was uh, five years my senior, and her mother and father were my parents' very close friends. You see, all these couples that met up in the Tatra Mountains decided to settle in the town of Livares, which is north of Prague, and live together as a community, be each other's family. I never knew their, you know, what they had in common. I still don't know, but I will ask Vera soon. Did they talk about the Holocaust? Did they all let it go? But nevertheless, they didn't have to share that. They knew that they had this common experience, this common time. So um, I look forward to hearing many more stories from Vera. Um, just a few pictures that I want to share. So this is my mother's family. And this is a picture from before the war. This is my mom. And this is the only Saint Irene. We came to Pittsburgh because Irene never had any children. She had a baby boy who was born, stillborn in America. Because of her she went through crossing all the borders. She had proper nutrition. And by the time she came to America, that child was not viable. This uncle died of typhus at the end of the war. So he made it through the entire war. And at the end, typhus was rampant. And he died at the end of the war. But they didn't learn that until later. This was the Hungarian man. This is my grandmother, who I'm named after. My grandfather, who died of natural causes. My uncle Ben, who lives in America and has two children, and I'm very close with. And of course, my Aunt Irene. We came to this bird because my mother said, Aunt Irene raised me. Aunt Irene, born 11, 11, 19, 11, died last of all these siblings. She outlived my mother by nine years. This was a reunion. So the sisters, and from 1958, even in communism, you couldn't communicate between communist countries. So my, my father, it's one letter is 1957, one says 58. So let's say somewhere between 57 and 58, you could finally write and you could figure out who was where. That's when my father first communicated with his sister. My father was the eldest, and Jenny was the second. So she, um, they were able to communicate together and I uh, were able to visit. My aunt Julia, who lived in Russia, very close to my other aunt, my, my mother found her, my Hungarian aunt, of course, that's who we went to visit in Hungary, and that was me, and that's my cousin who belongs to her, and my cousin who I met twice in the past two years, the Hungarian cousin. I haven't seen him since I was 11. So with these cousins, uh, the American cousin I met for the first time in my life were at his garden as well, we came two weeks before his arm as well, we as green as green can be. And my Hungarian cousin I didn't see from the age of 11, he was 13, till two years ago. Okay, Facebook is a wonderful thing, we were able to communicate before that, but really did not see each other. So that's what the Holocaust did to me. Took me away from my very first cousins. When I came to America, I couldn't communicate with my American cousin, then I had to still communicating in Hungarian with my Hungarian cousins, so very difficult family relations. My father's family, on the other hand, he had the one sister, had two children, there were a lot of twins in the family, so there's a very nice, large family of 20 um, in Israel, plus extra cousins. But I'm not anybody here. So my Passover dinner is, is my children and grandchildren, and we'll see later. Um, let's see later. This is Yamal's picture, the one who took my mother in after the war with her. And then there's hope for the next generation. So that is, that is the family. So last year, celebrating um, my birthday. And I'm very fortunate to, to have them around. Um, in nine, my father and mother stayed in Czechoslovakia. You couldn't get out from 1964. You were allowed to leave in 1964 for Israel. About three quarters of the Lebanese community immigrated to Israel. My father did it for two reasons. One is because he had a tremendous job in Czechoslovakia. He, um, he was in charge of the whole grain production um, and setting the prices. He became a statistician. 
Which one of the locals is paying attention? What education did my dad have? How many years of school? Sixth grade. How does somebody with a sixth grade education then become so powerful? He got a GED, then he went for his master's. I used to play under the kitchen table while he got his master's, and then he got his job. He finally felt secure. He had a great job. He didn't want to leave for Israel, which in 1964 was a very difficult place. And his sister was in Russia. He didn't want to abandon her. The Russians were not able to get out at that point yet. So he basically missed my father for about six months because he was packing up all the other immigrant families, all the other you know, families that he knew since the war, and they were all moving to Israel. And that's when this Vera left for Israel. Uh, we stayed here from 1968 when we were in Budapest visiting and the borders were closed because the Russians decided to uh, overtake the Czech Republic. It was becoming Czechoslovakia at that time. It was becoming way too democratic for their liking. It was Czechoslovakia, just to refresh everybody's memory, is in the very center of the communist, then communist bloc. And they couldn't afford to geographically lose Czechoslovakia because then the others would fall, which is what ended up happening in Germany. So they had to, um, so they invaded Czechoslovakia. We couldn't get home for four days. Within a year, a third of the Czech educational, uh, educated uh, people immigrant left Czechoslovakia illegally. They would go either to Yugoslavia with a small suitcase for a summer vacation and not return, or they would put on a backpack, and my friend that showed me where, and ski right into Austria. Um, the chefs were bleeding because they were losing anybody, a doctor, an engineer, somebody who felt they were make a living in, in, in a democratic country were leaving. So they closed the border. My parents had to make a decision. Do they also become one of those illegal immigrants? Or do they apply for a visa to immigrate to the United States? We were sponsored by my hand. They just, my father said, one time in my life, I left everything behind. I'm not doing that again. I have worked way too hard. So they applied for a visa, and much to my detriment, they got it. I was shocked. I didn't want to go to America. I didn't want to learn to speak any language. I was Czech. And, um, they sent all the boxes over to Pittsburgh, and uh, we flew out on a jet through uh, England into New York, where we met by my aunt. I must say that again, my parents escaped by the skin of their teeth. When the ships realized how many people they were losing, they said, no one's allowed to leave for a vacation, for any reason at all. Just nobody leaves. And the day they decided that is the day we were leaving to Slavia. So here my parents were with no apartment, no job, boxes already sent on a ship to the United States, just our suitcases, and they didn't know they would be allowed to leave. So after much discussion with the, with the diplomats and who we were there, it was determined that we had visas, they knew we were leaving legally, so they knew we were leaving, so we were put on a plane. And um, I can't imagine what my parents went through for those, for that hour or two more long that went on. I was 11. I was oblivious to all this. I was just crying because I had to say goodbye to my girlfriend. And on the plane, my dad had a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. And uh, I said, not in a nice loud voice, Daddy, you don't smoke, why do you have cigarettes? Well, he had hundred dollar bills rolled in there because on the black market, he was able to exchange our check rounds for, um, for cigarettes, for American dollars as part of his life. With. Um, my ring, and I'll show them off my ring by hand, because this diamond was actually part of what they cashed in their life savings in. They went to East Germany and got um, some diamonds and gold. What Jews have been doing for centuries. It's easy to travel with, with gems. You can't pay cash when you make it. Always, gems always talk the international language. So that's what they did. I'm not sure how much on the time. We look good on time. Oops. Um, I would like to, do, to open up the floor to questions because I'm going to just want to talk. So please feel free to ask me anything you wish to ask. My parents like as much as I can answer or my own. But if you could just clarify back to the beginning of the story. You were born in Czechoslovakia. 
and you didn't cut until you were 11. Okay, so that just starts the framework of going back. You were there, right? So because usually four guys on I always try to cover my parents' story more than my own. So I was born in Czechoslovakia, and my parents were not supposed to have me. They were married in 1951, and my mother both pregnant in 1952.